Chapter 15 discusses genes and proteins. We'll look specifically at the genetic code, prokaryotic transcription, eukaryotic transcription, RNA processing, and then finally ribosomes and protein synthesis. The genetic code is read from DNA into RNA and finally into the amino acids that form peptide bonds and proteins. The process of transcription guides DNA to RNA within the nucleus and it's translation that processes mRNA into proteins. Both DNA and RNA consist of nucleotides, which there are five in total, while proteins are made up of amino acids, of which there are 20. It takes three nucleotides to code for a single amino acid, and this concept, the 3 to 1, is known as the triplet code of DNA. The entire idea, the DNA, RNA, protein pathway, is referred to as the central dogma, because at the time that it was created, it was thought to be central to all life on Earth. More about those amino acids. The, ton the 20 structures of amino acids found in proteins are seen here. Each amino acid is composed of an amino group, a carboxyl group, and a side chain that's highlighted in blue. The side chain may be nonpolar, polar, charged, not charged. Some of them are quite large and some of them are quite small. It's the variety of amino acid side chains that gives rise to the incredible variation of protein structure and function. So, one more time. Instructions on DNA are transcribed into messenger RNA, while ribosomes are able to read the genetic information inscribed on the messenger RNA, and they use that information to translate the message into the language of amino acids to form a protein. The genetic code is degenerate, so that means that some amino acids can be coded for by multiple codons. It's like having four different words for the color red. It means that you can make some mistakes in your RNA code, but you still have a decent chance of not really messing up your amino acids. The codons all mean different things. Some are nonsense codons, which is just another way of saying stop transcription here. And uh, while there is only one codon that means start, it's AUG. Most interestingly, the code is universal. With very few exceptions, all life forms use the exact same genetic code. There are about 10 to the 84th potential combinations for all of the 20 amino acids, so there isn't much concern about overlap. Inserting or deleting one or two nucleotides can drastically shift the health of a potential protein. Codons, as I mentioned, are read in groups of three, so if you add or delete just one or two, you move every amino acid after that point into a new reading frame, and therefore they're all read wrong. An entire protein can be altered or destroyed in this process. It's actually safer, per se, for the health of a protein to add or delete an entire amino acid. So how exactly, you might be wondering, is that RNA made? Let's look first a prokaryotic transcription. Prokaryotic DNA exists in circular rings known as plasmids. The DNA must be unwound and when it's opened up to be copied, a transcription bubble is made. There are two separate strands of the DNA. The template strand is the strand that will be copied while the non-teplin strand is the strand that will be left alone. Remember when you're making RNA to DNA, there are different base pairs used. RNA contains uracil, not thymine. You create your RNA to simply bond with the template strand, matching up your nucleotides as you would have before, but instead of attaching thymine to your adenines, you attach a uracil instead. The whole process starts at the initiation site, also known as the plus one site. Everything prior to the initiation site is said to be upstream, and everything after that is referred to as being downstream. In prokaryotes, transcription, translation, and degradation of mRNA can actually happen at the exact same time. Proteins use the same RNA polymerase to transcribe every gene that they have. Polymerases are composed of four major subunits, the alpha, alpha prime, beta, and beta prime subunits, and when initiating the process, they can have a fifth subunit known as the sigma unit, or the sigma factor. When all five pieces come together, the polymerase is referred to as a halo enzyme. The entire enzyme is looking for the promoter sequence to which it binds. The negative 35 region is recognized specifically by the sigma factor and the negative 10 region is recognized by the other subunit. Remember, this is all a reference to the plus one initiation transcription start site. Binding at the negative 10 region unwinds the DNA. Once this occurs, the sigma factor leaves the unit and the polymerase continues on in the process. 
The creation of RNA proceeds in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction at a rate of about 40 nucleotides per second. Base pairing between RNA and DNA isn't terrifically stable, so RNA polymerase helps to hold the system in place. Nucleotides are added one by one until the termination site is reached. Termination signals can be protein-based or based in the RNA code itself. Rho-dependent termination is controlled by Rho, that's R-H-O, proteins that follow the DNA strand. When it hits a string of guanines, the whole process stalls and ends. Rho-independent termination is controlled by DNA nucleotides. In rich cytosine guanine regions, the RNA will actually end up binding back on itself, creating a hairpin after it's been transcribed because those nucleotides are drawn to one another. Once that hairpin is created, the RNA polymerase lets go of the new mRNA and DNA strand. The DNA closes back up and the pre -MR and the mRNA is created. Multiple polymerases can transcribe a single bacterial gene while numerous ribosomes can currently translate the mRNA transcripts into polypeptides. In this way, a specific protein can rapidly reach a very high concentration in the bacterial cell. This can occur in eukaryotic cells because there's a separation from the different types of machinery, mRNA is made inside the nucleus while all of the ribosomes are found on the outside. Eukaryotic transcription is similar to that of prokaryotes. However, transcription and translation cannot occur at the same time because of the existence of the nucleus and the nuclear envelopes. In eukaryotic transcription, there are some differences in the enzymology that makes the process a little bit more complex. For example, there are three different RNA polymerases that work inside eukaryotic individuals. The three different RNA polymerases are simply labeled RNA, pole 1, 2, and 3. The individual polymerases can have 10 plus subunits to them, so the enzymology gets pretty advanced pretty quickly, as you can see in this picture over here to your right. The individual polymerases have three different jobs. Pole 1 is found only in the nucleolus, and it's what composes ribosomal RNA. It's never translated into a protein. Pole 2, on the other hand, is found in the, nu the general nucleus space, and it synthesizes all of the protein coding nuclear pre-mRNA. All RNAs start out as a nuclear pre-RNA before they're processed. Pole 3 is in the nucleus, and it makes small nuclear pre-mRNAs, and a lot of them end up making transfer RNAs or tRNAs, but of course they have to go through that pre-stage as well before they're groomed and released into the cell. We can identify RNA polymerases, oddly enough, by a toxin that comes from mushrooms. This toxin is known to affect the different polymerases in different ways. So when we find a new gene, we can expose that particular section to this particular toxin, see how the effects are weighed, and then move to identify it. Here are the location, products, and sensitivities of the three different RNA polymerases. This table is taken directly from your book and helpful to write out a couple of times, and you'll have these down pat. Eukaryotic promoters are much larger than their prokaryotic counterparts. The Tata box binding regions sit at about negative 30, and they aren't terribly thermodynamically stable. It's pretty easy to unwind DNA in that region, which is really convenient. There are even more promoters known as cat boxes, GC rich, or octomer boxes, and even more that your book doesn't go into. They function just to increase the transcription rates, though, and they aren't what the uh, eukaryotic version of a sigma unit is specifically looking to bind to. In this picture, a generalized promoter of a gene transcribed by RNA polymerase 2 is shown. Transcription factors recognize the promoter. The RNA pole 2 then binds and forms transcription initiation complex. Once binding, certain sections might leave, certain sections might be added, but the whole unit moves synchronously down the DNA strand. There are some more transcription factors that add themselves on to the RNA polymerase 2. One group is the basal transcription factors. They help to regulate the frequency of pre-mRNA creation, so they ensure we don't have extra RNAs floating around. They help with the formation of pre-initiation complexes, and in your books and in various pictures, you'll always see them labeled as TF, and we have TF ones for those that bind with RNA polymerase 1, TF2s, and then they just kind of tack letters onto the end. So in this picture, for instance, you can see it, you can see TF2D. So it's the fourth transcription factor known to bind with RNA polymerase 2.
There are other units that assist in this process. Some are called enhancers and they increase transcription rates. Silencers decrease transcription rates and the moral of the story is that this is all very tightly regulated. The promoter structures for RNA poll 1 and 2 were greatly studied. RNA poll 1 has two GC rich promoter sequences that exist between negative 45 and plus 20. So you can see that they're quite expansive. There are even additional promoters that might work with RNA poll 1 that are found at about negative 180 and negative 105. In polymerase 3, there are a lot of upstream promoters and even some promoters are found within the genes themselves. So genetic expression has lots of potential variables. After the initiation begins, we worry about elongation and termination. Elongation, as before, continues in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. It's pole 2 that does the vast majority of our transcriptions. The process of opening the DNA as we move down the eukaryotic chromosomes is a little bit more complex. We receive some help from some fact proteins that remove the histones to get them out of the way. They also help in rebuilding the nucleosomes after they've been transcribed. When it comes to termination or ending the process, pole 1, 2, and 3 are ended differently. Pole 2 continues on. Quite a few nucleotides pass the gene and we just worry about cleaving the la that last bit off later. Pole 1 requires a termination signal from a very specific nucleic acid sequence, while pole 3 makes a little hairpins, similar to the row independent termination that we saw in those prokaryotic organisms. Once we have all of these RNAs, they need to be processed, at least when we're looking at eukaryotic organisms. There are a few different steps we undergo. In step one, the RNAs are covered in RNA stabilizing proteins. Remember, they have open ends, or open sides, technically speaking, of nucleotides, and those really like to bond. So we coat them in something that keeps them from sticking to themselves. In step two, we add a methyl guanosine cap. That's just a bunch of guanines added again and again to the 5' prime end. In step 3, we tack on about 200 adenine residues and refer to that end as the poly-A tail. And in step 4, we remove the introns or the intervening sequences in the mRNA and we bind all the exons together. It might seem weird that we spent time coding for introns, but this splicing, referred to as alternative splicing, allows us to have more variability in our potential RNA. It basically makes our genes a little bit more complex and allows us to do more with them. Here's another picture of what's happening when we're splicing our RNA transcript together. So we add the guanine cap on the 5' prime end and the poly A tail on the 3' prime end. We cut out our introns and splice together our exons. If we wanted to, we could actually splice those exons together in a different order. Maybe that mRNA would read 213 rather than 123, and now we're capable of making a whole new protein. It might have a new function for our bodies. Pre mRNA splicing involves this precise removal of those introns from the primary RNA transcript. The splicing process is catalyzed by protein complexes called spliceosomes, and they're just composed of proteins and RNA molecules known as small nuclear RNAs. You might recognize those. They're made by RNA polymerase 3. The spliceosomes can recognize the sequences that start on the 5' prime end of the introns, and they make their final cut at the 3' prime end of the intron. They're simply removed, and those nucleotides are recycled for later. The processing of ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA works a little bit differently than the processing of the mRNA. Enzymes are simply used to cleave their precursor molecules and then their final links undergo processes like hydrogen bonding and it just brings the RNAs into their final 3D structures. They can be transported out of the nuclear envelope and into the cytoplasm to complete some of this processing and then they just start their jobs. Seen here is a space-filling model of a tRNA molecule that adds an amino acid to a growing peptide chain. The anticodon AAG binds to the codon UUC on the RNA. The amino acid phenylalanine is then attached to the other end of the tRNA. This is going to plug in like a toothpick through a hamburger bun, and the little amino acid sticking out on the other end will be bonded to the next one in the process of translation. The final section of this chapter, 15.5, discusses ribosomes and protein synthesis. Proteins account for more mass in, in a living organism than any other molecule besides water. 
Amino acids are, are covalently strung together by interlinking peptide bonds, and their lengths can vary from just 50 amino acids to over 1,000. The amino group of one acid is attached to the carboxyl group of the next, as seen here in this picture. Protein synthesis machinery is composed of two major groups. There are the ribosomes. Ribosomes, technically speaking, are complex macromolecules with very distinct polypeptides, and they're made of small and large subunits. They look a lot like the small and large portion of a hamburger bun. The small units bind the mRNA template, while the large unit binds the transfer RNAs. So those transfer RNAs are just structural RNA molecules and organisms usually have between 40 and 60 types. They're capable of recognizing the mRNA codon by binding nucleotides. On the other end, they're capable of linking amino acids together. tRNAs have to meet three conditions. They have to recognize the appropriate aminoacyl tRNA synthetases, which is a very fancy word for it. They have to be able to recognize the enzyme that's going to give them their amino acid. They need to be able to recognize ribosomes so they know who to bind with. And then they also need to be able to recognize the correct sequence on the mRNA. They plug in just like a, th a three-pronged outlet does by matching up the nucleotides just like you would in DNA replication or RNA transcription. When you look at protein synthesis in prokaryotes, it's divided into three phases. There's initiation, which we've already talked about, elongation, and then termination. When we form that initiation complex, we work with three different initiation factors, simply named one, two, and three. There's a special one that gets its own name, and we refer to it as tRNA-MET. tRNA-MET binds the AUG, the start codon, and helps with this whole process. The shine delgarno sequence is just upstream of that very first AUG, and it helps to initially anchor the ribosome onto the mRNA in the right place, and then the whole unit will just slide down the mRNA from the 5' prime to 3' prime end. In eukaryotic organisms, the initiation complex is a little bit more advanced. We look at our mRNA, we look at the different ribosomal units, initiation factors, and then nucleoside triphosphatases, that's ATP or GTP, they need to help with this process. And then they have a slightly different tRNA MET. In this instance, we refer to it as a MET tRNA I. It has a slightly different charged structure than the MET that helps start this process in eukaryotic organisms. Its job is to recognize the guanine cap that we added. Some cap binding proteins and initiation factors actually physically move the ribosome to the right end of the RNA to get it in place. When the start codons are recognized, a lot of this complex is simply going to leave. It was just there to make sure that everyone was appropriately situated before we underwent protein synthesis. There are three components to translation. We worry about initiation, elongation, and termination. When we look at a ribosome, there are three different binding sites to consider that help with the, with the elongation and termination. The A site binds incoming tRNAs, the P site bonds amino acids together, and the E site releases the empty tRNAs. The initial tRNA, the one with that net hanging off of it, is the only one that's capable of entering the P site without first binding the A site. The formation of the peptide bonds as the tRNAs toggle in and out of these open slots is assisted by peptidyl transferases. They help to form those peptide bonds in between the amino acids that you see building a chain down in step three. Once a nonsense codon comes through the P site, it actually tells the ribosome to add a water molecule. Once the water molecule is ended, the entire mechanism opens up to release mRNA and the polypeptide. The polypeptide can then go on grooming itself, maybe inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum and onto the Golgi body, where it's folded into their final structures for use in the body. And thus ends the process of translation and this chapter.